I, I describe it as kind of monetary chaos. My belief is that they can never stop printing. It's a, it's a treacherous environment for investors, but gold, you know, people knock it, but it's actually one of the better performing asset hit. Bonds are down 20%, stocks are down 20%, gold's down 6% year to date. Lawrence Leppard is an equity investor manager known for his many successful investments in gold and silver mining companies. In this highlight, Leopard believes we are headed to an economic disaster, but he offers his expertise for his top three stocks so that viewers can profit off this recession if they act now. Yeah, the global macro, right? <laughs> what a mess. Um, it's extremely volatile, and I don't think we've, we're in uncharted waters and nothing new there. My belief is that what we're slowly seeing is a change um, from a system where uh, the central banks could control everything to a system where the central banks are not going to be able to control everything. And, you know, I, I describe it as kind of monetary chaos. Um, and we're going to we're going to swing back and forth between high inflation and, and the risk of deflation. And so, you know, this is the problem that the Fed is faced with. And as we all know, they've kind of packed themselves into a corner right now. And with that as a backdrop and understanding the way that, you know, uh, d Democratic and other governments work, uh, my belief is that they can never stop printing. And although they may be trying to right now, and for some time they will, eventually the, the damage and the pain that's going to cause are going to force them to go back to where they were before. And that's because the system is built on ever-increasing credit. And the alternative is, is, a, is a deflationary depression. And so, uh, you know, although we're in what would look like a, a, a deflationary impulse here, a very big one, um, I think that there'll be a time when they'll have to change policy because um, the, the conditions will demand it. And Larry, when you say the system which they used before, what do you mean specifically? Well, I mean the monetary system. You know, the, the, way, the way we've constructed our monetary system using leverage on leverage and the way the governments operate using continually, continual growth and sovereign credit. And so what we're really encountering right now, in my view, is a sovereign debt crisis. Um, you know, it's the bursting of the everything bubble that got created. It all was kicked off when... They went to a ZERP, 0% interest rates from 08 to 015. I mean, that was a crime against you know, capitalism in a sense. Um, if, you can't, if you don't have an interest rate on the money, then the money has no value intrinsically. And so it led to all kinds of capital misallocations. And, and now we're seeing, those, we're seeing the, the effects of that policy come home to roost on all of our assets. And it's what's, it's what's making the environment incredibly difficult for all investors, you know, sadly so. But... Um, you, you know, you can't undo. I mean, what I see is very similar to what happened in 29. I mean, people say, well, I don't want to have a bust. Well, OK, you shouldn't have had the boom. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know the, the big boom that was created, you know, NASDAQ up 16x from 09. I mean, it's got to be corrected. And, um, you know, there are implications, right? This is all crystallized on a tweet that you have pinned to the top of your Twitter account. Two simple lines. One says gross domestic product. The other one, all sectors, debt, securities and loans, liability level. I think you've made it pretty clear why you've had that tweet pinned up there since then. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, it's, you cannot increase debt forever because you can't service it. And so we were in a big deflationary period for the last 40 years. And I think that ended on March 2020. I mean, you had, you know, the 10 year was at 43 bips. I mean, my, my view is that we are now in a, in a new world, in an inflationary environment, and that um, it will only continue to, to grow, the, the inflation that we currently experience, which is not to say there won't be uh, periods when it slows down. I mean, I think it's going to be very volatile in both directions. It's, it's a treacherous environment for investors, but the things I conclude pretty sound, solidly are that bonds are a bad place to be, and that um, you know over time, I think commodities and and, and equities that are equities tied to things will do better than equities that are tied to growth and ideas, because I think we'll, we'll be in a stagflationary period, period and there will not be a lot of growth. And that's my belief. So that sets out very clearly your global macro outlook. But right. how does that apply to the industries that we're about to talk about? Yeah, if you look at it, so the, the, the conditions, I think, are going to be very similar to the 1970s. I was a teenager at that time. And in, in those conditions, the bonds were just total a total disaster. I mean, there was no worse investment than bonds. Equities were very choppy. They were pretty much a disaster. I mean, you, you kind of held your purchasing power, but barely. Um, and the, the areas that did extremely well were commodities. I mean, the two top performing industry categories in the 70s were the oil stocks and the gold stocks. And of course, I focused on the gold stocks, and that's the reason why. My macro outlook informs me that gold stocks, I think, will be the top performing asset category in the next 10 years. 
I mean, I've been looking into these companies that we're about to talk, uh, that we're about to discuss. And, and as I look at them, it seems like they maybe all are in a similar space in part because of what the Fed is doing right now. So where do you see this entire industry inside that that global? Yeah, perspective well, we're, so so to, you know, to give you some context, um, gold did extremely well and the gold stocks did extremely well um, in the in 2020 as a result of the money printing and the, and the inflation that was going on. Um, you know, the Fed was at the time quite accommodative, and that was very beneficial to assets which take advantage of the inflation. So they reflected the inflation that we're now experiencing. They could see it. As we all know, the Fed has now decided to uh, try the Volcker playbook. And, uh, and, and so the theory is that they're going to get inflation under control. Inflation is going to come down and you don't need gold and you don't need gold stocks. That's the theory. I think the reality and the practice is that they're not going to be able to control inflation, that ultimately their activities are going to cause something to break, and that when they do, they're going to have to come back in with more money and there will be more inflation. And so so the bet we're making is, in my opinion, that the central banks will not be successful in what they're doing. But to your point, where we are right now, we've just had a huge drawdown in the gold stocks. I mean, um, you know, my fund was up 98% in 2019, it was up 122% in 2020. You know, I've given half of that 2020 run back uh, throughout 2021 and 2022. Um, so, you know, these things are volatile. And basically, when you're looking at um, when you're looking at these assets, they they react to what they think the future price of gold is going to be. They're, they're leveraged bets on gold. I mean, you could just buy gold and gold, you know, people knock it, but it's actually one of the better performing asset categories. Other than cash, it's probably the best performing asset category this year. I suppose some commodities have done a tad better, but you know, bond. Larry, let's let's get into the three ideas. Let's start out with your first pick. That's Equinox Gold. This is a Canadian company, dual listed on the NICE uh, EQX. There, tell me about the company, but also tell me from the get go. I assume that you have exposure to this company. You're invested. Yeah, I have exposure to all three of these ideas. Obviously, this is what I do. My my people pay me to 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 pick the best names, and I've tried to pick the safest, largest names, and then two of the safest, largest names, and then one that's a little bit more speculative, but I think quite safe uh, or good. The first one's Equinox. So this is a billion dollar market cap company headquartered in Toronto, based in Canada. Uh, Ross Beatty, who's kind of a mining legend, you know, a, a billionaire built on mining stocks is the chairman and owns 8% of it. So that's always a nice thing. And I think they have one of the best management teams in the business. And that's extremely important in this area because I should say mining, gold mining is a difficult business. You're, you're breaking rocks and, uh, and Murphy's law applies. And, and you know, there, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, and, and sometimes they do. It's just a, a matter of how it works. I mean, if we take a look at this company, it was trading at $8.90 back in April. And now we're trading somewhere around three fifty. Right. So to me, it's just it's an incredible bargain at these levels. It's just and this is this is a reflection of the macro that we were speaking about earlier. Right. I mean, everyone thinks that the Fed will be successful in containing inflation and therefore you won't need gold stocks. I personally think everyone's incorrect in that assumption, but obviously that's where their markets. Um, yeah. So these guys are based in Canada and they have seven producing mines and they're in safe jurisdictions. And that's important, too. I mean, when you're picking gold mining stocks, there's some companies and, and that operate in countries that are not friendly to gold mining or that can seize mines or tax mines. And so I think Ross has been rather smart here. He's his 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 portfolio of companies is in the United States, Canada, um, Mexico and Brazil. So um, in my opinion, those are all safe countries, even though Brazil, South America is a place where well, there are others. But South America is one of the places where there's some countries that are uninvestable, in my opinion. And so he's got seven operating uh, mines, and then he's got four growth projects and expansion in those existing mines. And I think the, the most interesting thing here to me is, I mean, the, to me, the lowest risk category of investing in gold stocks, and they're, they're really three buckets, right? They're the producers, they're the developers, and they're the drill stories. The producers are the safest because they have positive cash flow. When you have positive cash flow, you can't go bankrupt, right? Um, you know, the development and the drill stories, they all need to absorb cash to hopefully produce gold. And so this is a develop, this is a, a producer. Um, in this year, they should have two hundred and fifty million dollars of EBITDA, with a market cap of of a billion. That's four x EBITDA. That's not bad, right? Compare that to Apple or some of the others out there. But more importantly, I, and as I was saying, I think the lowest risk category are producers that are growing, because you know you could buy Barrick or you could buy Newmont, 
the problem they have is that they have 5 million ounces a year of production. And remember, a gold mine is a wasting asset. You're pulling gold out of the ground. Once you've done it, it's not there anymore. You got to find more gold. So, you know, it's like a, it's like being an oil company. You're, you're always looking for new resources. So you're always exploring. And um, in my view, you know, when you're smaller, it's easier to replace what you mine. Because if you're Barrick or Newmont, it's hard to find 5 million ounces of gold a year. I mean, they're, they're managing, barely managing to do it in some years. They're not in others. In this particular case, Equinox has been able to grow their resources very nicely. They currently have all category resources of 30 million ounces of gold. That's pretty interesting because if you take the market cap, divide by 30 million, that means you're paying $33 for every ounce of gold in the ground. Now, if they were above ground, they would be worth $1,700. Obviously, the difference is you've got to spend money to mine them. And so, you know, the thing I think that they've done a nice job with here is, is they've got a nice basket of assets and they've got a nice growth pattern. This year, they'll mine 580,000 ounces of gold. And, um, and next year, uh, well, a few years out, I think they're going to get to close to a million ounces of gold. So that's 40% growth in the underlying gold that they're, they're mining. And, um, and that's unusual in this industry. So this will, you know, projected um, Bloomberg consensus projected EBITDA in 2024 is $500 million. So that would imply that they're selling at 2x, two year out EBITDA, which is pretty cheap. Um, so it's it's a good situation. And, and, and typically, um, the way you value a gold company, or one of the ways you value a gold company is you you put a you put a price on each ounce that they're mining. So gold companies tend to be worth between four and six thousand dollars per ounce of gold that they mine. And if you if you apply that, I'll just I forgot to do it before the interview. But if you apply that to the five hundred and eighty, even if you apply the low end of the range, five eighty four thousand dollars an ounce, you know, that would be two point three billion dollars. So that's a double right there at the low end of the range. And then, you know, I think the, the number of ounces they mine are, are going to grow. And then, you know, I think the, the number of ounces they mine are, are going to grow. Click here to watch Gareth Salloway make his predictions for the best investments that will yield the highest returns in 2023.